If you brought a copy of the scriptures, would you open with me to the book of Esther and Esther chapter 6. And man, I was secretly hoping that what uh, Harold asked everybody to do last week, that great Baptist sin of leaving their assigned seats and moving to the front. I hoped it was going to catch. I prayed for it, but apparently my prayers aren't effective. The, uh, so, uh, hey, if you, if you ever next time you come in, you ever want to move closer to the front, I promise you the view's wonderful. All right, so anyway, you're in Esther chapter 6 tonight, and I'm glad you're here. Um, thank you, Pastor Charles, for leading us in a time of prayer. Um, the, uh, I don't know, sometimes people groups can start to run together in my mind. And uh, this particular people group was known to one of our church members who in her missionary service had served there in that area and, uh, and had worked among those folks. And hey, uh, here's the thing, you may never have heard of them, but she was praying among them and working among them for decades, decades before we ever got here. And uh, that's just the way God works. Hey, if you're, if, uh, if you're someone who's following along in our prayer times, uh, follow along on the prayer wall, then you already know this. But if not, can I encourage you to be engaged in this special season of prayer, particularly for Muslims uh, in different parts of the world? Right now in, uh, in Holy Days in Islam, uh, during the period of Ramadan, this time of fasting, and in an effort among Muslims worldwide to hear from or to gain faith favor with, uh, with God. They are in the process, they, they don't eat or drink from, uh, from sun up to sun down. And it's a period of time where they're earnestly seeking. But here's what you and I know, that uh, no matter how earnestly you seek, you can't hear from the one true God through that false system. We approach God, we hear from God through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm encouraging you to pray with us. Here's how, if you're wondering, I wonder how I could pray specifically for them during this period of time in that way. My prayer daily is that uh, God would speak to them through dreams and visions, visions of Esau, that there would be a figure that would appear in their dreams and tell them of his great love, of the love of the Son of God. And uh, that uh, they would, in curiosity, begin to seek and to pursue uh, knowledge about that and that witnesses would supernaturally be connected to them that they might hear and know. We have, uh, hey, in fact, we, we prayed for a family tonight that their particular people group falls in and among that. We've got another family that falls in and among that, that works specifically among Muslims uh, around the world. So, hey, this is a great way, a good way to labor with, to partner with uh, our folks. If you said, how can I be kept up with a particular people group or a particular focus every day? On our prayer wall, our team, Pastor Charles and Miss Grace, uh, uh, make sure that there's an update about a different day of Ramadan as we all enjoy, join together and pray together. What would it be like to appear? here in heaven one day and uh, to look right over there there's someone that you prayed for you didn't know you prayed for but you were praying for and then God just brings all that back to remembrance and tells you do you remember back in 2023 when you were, you go no I had no idea but yeah but that's a group that you called out and that's a believer who saw a vision and came to be and because of that they and their family know the Lord what kind of I don't know what rejoicing and hallelujahs look like in heaven yet but I bet that's the subject matter. Are you following me? Y'all are about as lively as a bunch of folks waiting for a tax audit. I'm just waiting on you to stir up so I can get up into, into Esther, okay? So, or maybe I'll just start the Bible study. All right, so there's a, uh, man. Hey, uh, one of the tools of screenwriting and storytelling is the use of an instrument called irony. The most powerful of the different forms of irony that are taught in that particular subject matter is a, what's called dramatic irony. You'd know it, but let me give you a name for it. It's when the audience knows something that a character in the story doesn't yet know. So it's, um, hey, it's when you're watching that horror movie and you can see the guy with the, with the hockey mask hidden in the barn full of chainsaws. And then you're watching these little unsuspecting people walk that way and you start to yell at your television, don't go in there, 
the boogers in there. Don't go in there. It's a, you know something that the characters in the story don't know. It's a, it's a tool used by storytellers. It's a tool used in the dramatic arts in order to keep folks interested in the story. It's watching, uh, um, it's, 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 it's one of the ways they draw you in. But it also happens in real life. When we look at this story, which is not something made for screen, but when we look at this story, this is real lives of real people, and yet God operates in an ironic way, uses dramatic irony. We know stuff about the story, about what's going on among the characters that the other characters in the story don't know. And today, we start to see a reckoning of that story as it's brought together. We see the irony unfolding in the drama. We see it materializing. Haman's got a plot, but unknown to him and really to the other characters, God's operating in providence with power toward a purpose that results in his own glory. It isn't really a question if you and I have ever experienced anything like that. We have. We've experienced it. The question is, is how often do we experience it? When was the last time, perhaps, that you experienced it? When was the last time you thought things should be one way, but there it was, there was a twist in the story, a dramatic irony, and it went a different way. In your life, you were, gonna, you were supposed to be in a place uh, doing something, and, and suddenly there's a plot twist in what takes place, and you're in a different spot, and, and you, your car didn't get crashed into, and you thought, man, that was coincidental, was it? Or was God operating in a way that you just didn't recognize yet, yet he knew and understood? Haman in chapter 5 recounts his greatness. You'll, you'll recall he gets all uh, upset and he draw, draws over some of his friends and he fixes them all steak. And, and then he sits around and he tells them how amazing he is and they all clap for him. And those closest to him, including his wife said, here's what you ought to do. Y'all just take Mordecai out. He's the one that's bugging you. Why don't you build a gallows 75 feet tall in the front yard? No wife has ever asked her husband to build a 75 foot tall tower in the front yard. Yet that's what took place here. And then she said, and then you can go and ask Ahasuerus if he'll give an order to kill Mordecai. And then everything will be better. You'll get rid of the nemesis in your story. Haman already has an order for genocide set up for the end of the year that's already been granted because he, was, he slipped it in past Osiris. He, he, uh, he told half a story and got it done. Everything he wants will come together, but he just can't get over the fact that, that Mordecai won't bow down and pay him homage. So as he moves from this uh, this part of the story of just being frustrated, we step into chapter six. I want to show you three kind of anchor points to hang around the story uh, so that you can kind of see how this works. The message simply entitled, The Irony of Providential Insomnia. We've been talking about providence. providence. I want to talk with you about that, how God works behind the scenes in a way he knows and that you know because you're reading the story, but Haman didn't know. In fact, Ahasuerus didn't know. Mordecai didn't know. Esther didn't know, but God knew. And I want you to see that with me. Three things for you to notice. Notice, first of all, the issue of insomnia, the issue of insomnia. Now, here's a question. How far will God go to accomplish his purpose? How far will God go? Does God just get involved in big things like geopolitical events? Or will God get involved in the weeds, the details, and involve himself in, in smaller things? See, sometimes we have a way of categorizing God's concern and only giving him credit for things, only bothering him with things that we think are major factors or things of perceived importance. I mean, it's all right for us to pray for global missions, but should we pray for a parking space? Or should we pray about our neighbors and we're walking around our neighborhood when there's big people groups somewhere? Maybe we should just spend all our time praying for big people groups and not pray for little things. Can I tell you something? In case you were wondering if you were going to wear out your welcome with God, he's just as concerned with the number of hairs on your head as he is the 96,000 lost people 
Somehow or another, he can keep up with all of those things, not lose the importance of any of those things, and not be tuckered out at the end of the day. I don't understand it all, but I know that he does. So what should we pray for? Did you know that even the most minute of details of life are not only under the Lord's control, but are often employed by him to move along the all things which he works together for good? Even the smallest of details, God's involved in those. We see some of that taking place here in Esther chapter 6. Look at the first three verses. It says, during that night, the king could not sleep. So he gave an order to bring the book of records, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written what Mordecai had reported concerning Bigtana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who were doorkeepers that they had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And the king said, what honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the king's servants who attended him said, well, nothing's been done for him. It's uh, just setting the stage. We know that the same night that the gallows were being built, the king found sleep to be elusive. Now, I don't know what caused him to not be able to sleep. Maybe there was construction noise outside the window. Wouldn't that be ironic? If, in fact, Haman's construction activity actually kept the king awake. I don't necessarily subscribe to that. I'm just saying, what if? The reason I don't subscribe to it is because I think Osiris would have chopped his head off. I mean, he's a pretty unstable character. But anyway... Maybe it was construction noise. Maybe it was a terrifying dream. Maybe he had a, a dream that woke him up. And have you ever had one of those dreams where you're sleeping soundly and then you find yourself in the middle of an unfolding um, episode of cops? Or is that just me? And then you wake up and your heart's beating out of your chest and you're like, man, I'm so wide awake. I don't know what I'm going to do at this point. And you're, I mean, you were just wrapped up in the story. Has that ever happened to you? Maybe not cops. If it was, were you chasing them or getting chased? That's what I want to know. So, the, uh, uh, has that ever happened? Yep. Hey, hold it. I know verbal responses are tough. Do like this. Yes. yes. No. I'm not listening anymore. Any of those signs will work. Any of those will work. I'll be able to follow along. So, as you're thinking about this, what, what was it? What, if it was a terrifying dream, maybe it was like the one that tortured Nebuchadnezzar. If you're taking notes, just kind of keep up with the drama here from, from the book of Daniel. Daniel 2 and verse 1 said, In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. And his spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. And that said, his, his sleep left him. What that literally means in the original language is, him sleepy no more. His sleep eluded him, and his dreams were such that they caused his spirit, the emotions within him, his heart to race. It caused him to be anxious within him so that he called in all of his magicians and sorcerers. And some say he even called the 1-800 Dion Warwick line so he could find out what in the world's going on. Could somebody tell me what's happening? And then he wanted to know the meaning of the dreams, but to check the legitimacy of what people were telling him, he required those around him to tell him not only the, the interpretation of the dream, but the very substance of the dream. All the guys around him said, King, that's impossible. We can tell you what it means, but we can't tell you what you dreamed. He said, if you could tell me what it means, you could certainly tell me what it was I was dreaming. And they said, nobody's ever asked us to do that before. He says, uh, well, here's what he says, verses five and six of Daniel two. The king replied to the Chaldeans, the command from me is firm. <laughs> in other words, look me in the eye. What I'm saying I will not negotiate with. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you will be torn limb from limb and your houses will be made a rubbish heap. But if you declare the dream and its interpretation, you'll receive from me gifts and a reward and great honor. Therefore, declare to me the dream and its interpretation. Talk about decisiveness of leadership. Can I just say to you that he said to them, I will kill you or I'll write you a check. Your choice. Tell me what the dream says. That's pretty crazy stuff. The king's denied though and he orders all the wise men in the nation to be killed, including Daniel and the, the, those folks. But word gets back that uh, 
the Hebrew slave Daniel had had some experience interpreting dreams before. Daniel uh, 2, verse 26 to 28, the king says to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen in its interpretation? And Daniel answered before the king and said, as for the mystery about which the king has inquired, neither wise men or conjurers or magicians nor diviners are able to declare it to the king. However, there is a God in heaven. I, was there any witnesses in the room? However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the latter days. This was your dream and the vision in your mind while you were on your bed. And then Daniel goes on and he recounts it perfectly as God revealed it to him as he said only God could do it. But by the way, God can do it. Verses 46 to 48 of Daniel 2. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and did homage to Daniel and gave orders to present him with an offering and fragrant incense. And the king answered Daniel and said, surely your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries since you've been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Does God cause bad dreams to happen? Daniel says not only does he cause them, he gives them the full substance of it so that God can do what God does. I don't know what his dream was. It might have been like his. But with Osiris, something woke him up and he called for his secretary to come in and read to him the histories of the kingdom. Of all the subject matter he could have read, I'm not sure. Here's the equivalent of that today. Are you ready? Um, Man, President Biden says, I can't sleep well. Would somebody call over to the House of Representatives, bring the congressional record over and just tell me what's been taking place in Congress since forever. I'm asleep already, aren't you? Some of you are asleep and it's a sermon and it's an exciting sermon. And I don't know what your problem is, but I'm just, you could have dozed off in the midst of that and and that's what's going on here. The reader turns to a section of the record of the Chronicles of the Kingdom, which included an event that had taken place just a few years earlier. I'm thinking if you want the histories of the kingdom, you probably start back at the beginning of the kingdom. But he started in such a way that he was able to come to this section from just a few years earlier. And, uh, and he begins to read this story about how a man had saved Ahasuerus' life. Now, culturally speaking, this is, a, this is a pro tip. Culturally speaking, in that culture, if you were someone of importance and you wanted to pump up your resume, you would do acts of kindness toward those who had done kindness towards you. So if a, if a boy came over and, and cut your grass and, and you didn't know it, you might go out and wash his car and change his tires and get his oil changed and maybe pressure wash his house just so you could show how benevolent you are toward the kindness that someone had showed toward you. And that's kind of in the backdrop here. So uh, Sarah says, what, has, what should we do? What has been done for him? Has anything been done for him? Somehow, even though he knew of it, King Ahasuerus, it had been forgotten for years until such a night as insomnia hits, following an order of genocide and when Haman was having a little bout of of little man syndrome. That's not what I wrote, but that's probably what's safe for the room. Verse four, so the king said, who's in the court? Now Haman just entered the outer court of the king's palace in order to speak to the king about hanging Mordecai on the gallows, which he had prepared for him. This was important to Haman, by the way, because you remember what happens if somebody enters the king's court without an invitation, right? Isn't this what Esther's issue was? This could have been the thing that could have cost him his head, but he was, in, he was emphatic. I've got to do something about Mordecai. That's why Haman went in there. And just so happened that Haman's the one that comes in. Just so happened, it'd be after Ahasuerus reads about, hears about this thing that Mordecai had done for him. Just so happens it was on a sleepless night. Just so happens it was on a a sleepless night where he remembers this time where a man saved his life from years before that he had 
just so happened to forget for several years un until he asked for the Chronicles to be read, and it just so happens that was the page. Does God work in big details only, or is he involved even in the smallest of details? Just so happened. When I was a, a small boy, I, I, I think I was four or five, maybe five, maybe six, a small boy. My, uh, my grandparents had a camping area just down from the wilds in the western part of the state. Y'all know where the wilds is? Yeah, just down from the wilds. But this was back in the 1900s before they paved all those roads. And uh, some of the roads that were paved, you didn't know they were paved. They were so gravelly. But uh, she, Grandma had a, an old Willis Jeep. It was red. I mean, it was like it came out of World War II, and then they painted it red, and it was her Willis Jeep. And, and uh, if you know anything about Jeeps or Willis Jeeps, you know that those original military models, you just about couldn't get them stuck. That's why she liked it. You could take it just about anywhere. Well, that day, she and I are riding. She was an explorer at heart. And uh, that day, we're riding uh, around one of those mountain roads, one of those that if you looked off this side, you could, you could look down a long ways. And if you look over to this side, there's nothing but trees up on the hill. This side is a great drop off. This side's a, a hill. And we're coming around one of those curves. And in the curve, this is a true story, in the curve, the pin that holds the steering wheel and locks it into the tie rod thingies, the pinion system, that thingy that controls the wheel. Some of you are about trying to help me, but I appreciate that. I do. I got it. So the rest of you are sinners. So anyway, so the pin that holds the steering wheel to that fell out. Coming around the curb, headed over the cliff. And Grandma was an explorer, and she liked to explore fast, too. You couldn't go real fast, but it was fast enough that you don't have much time to think. We're going around the curb, over the cliff, and the, the steering wheel just free spins. There's no way to control that. Some of you are going, I'm never letting my children ride with their grandparents again. It doesn't matter what they're driving. It doesn't matter. I'm never going to. Just so happens, there's a rock in the road that just happened to hit the tires as she's going over the cliff, hit the tires in just a way to knock them this direction and spun the Jeep and, and buried it into the side of the mountain. And I'm here today. Just so happens. Is God only, some of you are going, why are we being judged for your kind? Anyway, so think about this for just a second. Is God only concerned with geopolitical events? Is God only concerned with entire people groups? Or can I come to him and pray to him and count on him in even the smallest details? Is he not still the same God who makes rocks and then places them in the road at just the right time and then brings a Jeep at just right? I don't know if you realize how crazy that is, but if a rock's like this and a tire's this wide to get the tire to hit the rock in such a way that it doesn't bounce over, but it turns back this way and it's powerful enough to be able to turn the whole steering system, not just the left wheel, but the left and the right to spin all of that in such a way that it can hit the side of the mountain instead of go over the cliff you tell me God's not involved in little details he can wake you up in the middle of the night he can give you the dream that woke you up he can bring along a, a rock he can cause the jeep to be in just such a way to do it and oh by the way just to put icing on the cake it just so happened he put a pin in my grandpa's toolbox that when he came out there to fix it he just crawled up under and shoved a pin up inside the thing and they drove the jeep off I was not allowed to ride in it the rest of the trip, by the way. Just so happens. Saved by rock or by the God who places rocks? Think about the times when even the littlest matter seemed to turn out for your good. Did you credit chance or the Christ? Fate or our Father? Not just the irony of insomnia, but notice with me the allure of arrogance. The allure of arrogance. Look at verse 6. 
So Haman came in, and the king said to him, What is to be done for the man whom the king desires to honor? And Haman said to himself, Catch us now. Who would the king desire to honor more than me? I went to high school with this guy. The times I shaved, I shaved him. That's going to hit you all in a minute. If the king's honoring anyone, Haman said, it must be me. If he's got anybody he wants to show honor to, it must be me. He's asking me, what should the king do to honor such a man? And he's got to be talking about me. Well, let me tell you, king, I've got some great ideas. Haman's great enemy was not Mordecai, by the way, but his own sense of self-importance. His undoing was not the disrespect of a person, but the devil of pride. Bible scholar Jason Meyer said this. He said, as finite creatures, we cannot fully grasp God's infinite revulsion against pride's rebellion. God hates pride. What makes pride, so catch us now, so singularly repulsive to God is the way that pride contends for supremacy with God himself, end quote. Pride. It's, it was Haman's downfall. That's why Peter counseled in 1 Peter 5 and verse 5, you younger men likewise be subject to your elders and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. But Haman was a man about himself. Thinking that the honor would be for himself, he responds to the king, verses 7 and following. Then Haman said to the king, <clears throat> for the man whom the king desires to honor, let them bring a royal robe which the king has worn and the horse on which the king has ridden and on whose head a royal crown has been placed and let the robe and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble princes and let them array the man whom the king desires to honor and lead him on horseback through the city square and proclaim before him, thus it shall be done to the man whom the king desires to honor. Then the king said to Haman, take quickly the robes of the horses you've said and do so for Mordecai the Jew who's sitting at the king's gate. Do not fall short in anything of all that you've said. Haman never saw it coming. Why? He was caught up in his own press clippings. He was interested in his own sufficiency or sometimes pride is our own insufficiency. The blinding force of pride draws us into a place that we can't turn back from on our own. It was the downfall of Satan. The angel of the morning who wanted to have his honor above that of God and cost him the role of the chief worshiper and his influence was so incredible that a third of the heavenly host were cast down from heaven with him. Hence you have the diablos, the slanderer, the accuser, the enemy of God, the condemned one and his demons for which hell was created. It was the downfall of Satan. It was the enticement of Eve. <laughs> Surely God has it said that. For God knows the day you eat of that fruit he's been keeping back from you, you'll be wise like God. You'll know good, good from evil. True, by the way. It was the lure of Judas. Judas thought we can finally get in charge of things and I'll have position. I just got to force this issue a little bit. It was the Achilles heel of everyone in this place today. Pride will catch all of us. The moment you think, man, I'm above it. I don't have to worry about that. I finally overcome it. I have nailed humility. I go, really? 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12 says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. Are there places that your pride leads you to or blocks you from? Chris, I, I can't serve the little children. You know, a person of my standing, stature, status, years. Well, I've, I've grown, grown beyond that. God needs me in a place of much higher significance. Or the flip side of that. 
I'm such a wretch, Chris. There's no way God could ever use me in anything like that. My sin, my failure, my lack of knowledge, it exceeds even God's ability to interrupt that. It sounds humble, but it's just another form of pride. I can't be gone, Chris, from my company or my family because it's going to crash without me. So I'm just not going to be able to go on those mission trips, but I'll pray for others that go. You, you can't be gone a week, 10 days. You're so essential to the operation of IBM that you can't be gone for 10 days. Really? I had a guy told me recently, he said, uh, man, if I were to make a job change, I don't know what would happen to this organization I'm in. <laughs> you know there's a hundred people that want your job, right? Yeah, but I mean, they all look to me for answers. <laughs> Sport, I think that's the word I used. If you put your finger in a cup of water and you pull your finger out, your influence is going to last as long as it takes to fill in the divot. You, I know you're amazing. You know you're amazing. But you know it was Jesus that made you that way, right? And he could make another one just like you. The same Jesus that said, if y'all don't worship, I'll cause the rocks to cry out and worship in your place. I'll take an inanimate stone that won't be used again for a couple thousand years when it's in front of an old Willis Jeep that saves Chris Aiken's hide. And I'll cause it to sing praises. We're probably not as important as we think we are. And if it all depended on us, we've taught it to depend on the wrong one anyway. The issue of insomnia, the allure of arrogance. Notice number three, the futility of fighting God. The futility of fighting God. I'm telling you, if Haman didn't know what was going on, it's starting to become clear in his mind at this point. Now, since I've been good to tell stories up to this point, let me tell you one of my favorite ones. One... One of my favorite things to do with my three-year-old grandson is um, proper people call it wrestling. I call it wrestling. And uh, it's to sit on the floor and allow that three-year-old to tackle me. And he knows he can do it. If I'm sitting on the floor, I'm down somewhere, he's going to run into me and push me over. And you know, he wins about every time. It seems even when I'm pushing back a little bit, he somehow can overpower me. And tackle when he likes to sit up on top of me or push down on me and show me how strong he is. And it's, it's, it's as though he's got it. But you know he's victorious for one reason and one reason only. Because I let him. Now if that's true for me, how much more true is it for those who fight against God? Verses 11 and 12. So Haman took the robe and the horse and arrayed Mordecai. Pause right there. He put the robe on Mordecai and helped him get up on the horse. Mordecai wanted him on the gallows. He helped him get onto the horse and put the king's robe on him. Catch that. Now, don't let that go, the humility in that. And he led him on horseback through the city square and proclaimed before him, Thus it shall be done to the man whom the king desires to honor. Then Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman hurried home mourning with his head covered. I was going to make a sports joke there. I'm going to let it go. He entered the court to seek Haman's life pursuing his own revenge and desiring to satisfy the insatiable pull of pride. But he left parading Mordecai through the streets as a herald. This is what happens when the king wants to honor somebody. The horse that Haman desired to ride was ridden by God's man and escorted by the man who sought his demise. The robe worn by the king and coveted by Haman was donned by the one that Haman despised. The homage and respect that Haman lusted after was expressed in his own proclamation toward the Jews who lived rent-free in his head as a word from the king. This is how the king honors whomever he wishes. And even his own wife, even Haman's own wife, poetically and prophetically voices the doom that awaits Haman when he comes home with his head covered. Verse 13 
Haman recounted to Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends everything that had happened to him. Then his wise men and Zeresh, his wife, said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you've begun to fall, is of Jewish origin, you'll not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. Paul's right there. Ain't she the one that had him build the gallows? <laughs> Isn't she the one that said, what you need to do is just kill this old boy. You should seek after his life. Now she's going, well, you'll never beat him. It didn't take her but a skinny minute. Haman's choices set in motion a course that became irreversible because he aligned himself against not Mordecai, but the one true God and against God's people whom God fights for. And as you think about this, I want you to think along two lines with me. Do, do you really think that your rebellion, whether that's great rebellion or something that you and I might call small rebellion, do you really think it'll work out? I mean... I, I wonder if sometimes us church broke people, like we've been in church for a while, we've seen folks pray to, for repentance and things of that nature, and I wonder if sometimes we don't sit there and go, well, I know I got sin in my life, but I'm not joining them. I mean, after all, God's going to cut me some slack. Do you really think that that rebellion's going to work out? Do you really think that just telling God no, just pressing on a little further into rebellion, just refusing God a little bit more, do you really think that somehow that's going to produce abundant life? See, in our mind, intellectually, I think we would say, man, there's no way that rebelling against God ever produces that. Yet, we press on in rebellion. We go, man, I, I could repent and turn from that, but I wonder if I just stayed in it a little bit longer if it might work out. Is that any different than the fighting against God that Haman did in his own way? You can't fight against God and win. Do you think God's just going to let it go? That he'll somehow be swayed to embrace your disobedience or will lose sight of it as though he, he got distracted with something? The same God who knows the hair count and the place in particulars of every bird, will he long overlook? the disrespect and the dishonor and the disobedience. To what end, Chris? I think to the end that it should bring us to a place of, I don't love the word, but fearfulness that we would walk away from an opportunity of repentance and push our luck one more day. There was a couple that sold a piece of property because they saw that Barnabas had gotten a lot of credibility for it and people clapped for him. And they sold a piece of property and I'm making up numbers now, but the, I'm not making up the, the sense of the story. They sold it for $10,000, but they said, now Barnabas brought all of it into the Lord's house Let's tell them we sold it for eight. We'll keep two and give them the rest. They'll clap for us and we'll still be able to pocket some money. And they brought it in uh, and said, man, we sold that. And the apostles stared right through them and said, how can you lie to the Holy Spirit like that? Was it not yours when you sold it? And yet you would dis... It, my, my translation, you would dishonor and disrespect God and treat so lightly his holiness that you just lied to him like that? They, the, you walked in, but the men will carry you out. And they dropped dead. No sooner than those men had taken them away, the spouse comes in and the same thing happens. The Bible says that great fear came over the church and uh, they had great reverence toward God, but they'd have, paraphrased again, they'd have nothing to do with the apostles. I think I understand that part, don't you? 
They said, man, we're not telling you anything just in case we happen to mess up a little something because you guys just, no, it really wasn't them. It was the holiness of God. I wonder how many times that God prompts us to do something and we go, I don't know, Lord. I think I'm going to hold on that for a little bit and deny the God of the universe who spoke everything into existence and with a word could bring it all to its conclusion. And yet we think, you know, I think I can, I think I can sit on this for another day. Do you think it ever works out to fight against God? The second thing would be, do you and I ever need to fear our enemies or become anxious before our opponents when we're aligned with God? See, that's, that was actually the thrust of that last song that, man, we really love to sing. There is another in the fire. There's another in the waters. Yeah, but the waters, they're unstoppable. I've seen the power of flood. I've seen the, the overwhelming force of of water and how it's unstoppable and it takes everything in its path. It's destructive in its power. And yet God said, Psst, it's far enough. If God can do that to the water, whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? Could you, do we really have to fear things that come against us? Is there ever really a situation or a circumstance that's so big, so overwhelming that we look at it and go, there's no way God could bail me out of this. Is it ever so big that we're, there's never a time when there's something that ought to cause us to cower. If we're doing the will of God. Now, if we're away from God, then we're on our own. It's the best we can hope for. It's every man for himself. Let's grab your own lifeboat. Push somebody down, take theirs. But if we're with God, is there anyone who could come against us? Is there anyone who could overwhelm us? You may look and say, I'm going to tell you, Chris, I, I know I'm supposed to share the gospel with that person, but... Uh, but I tell you, I don't think that's going to work. I think what we've got to do is we've got to, we've got to bait them in with cherry cake. Then if, we, if we'll just, we'll do it this way. That way won't work. This way will work. Are you saying that God and his gospel aren't sufficient and able to change a person's life? That Jesus really can't do what he said he came to do? The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that you might have life and right now have it in abundance. Is there anything too powerful for him? When Sarah laughed at God, when God, when the pre-incarnate, the Christophany, speaks to Abram and says, your wife's going to get pregnant. She laughed and he said, why is she laughing? He said, you ask her. That's her show. I laughing. He said, oh, you did laugh. I heard you right in your heart. That should have been her first clue. Is there anything too difficult for the Lord? Hey, listen, if he can cause a woman who can't have babies to have babies and then cause dead people to get up and rise, he can cause the water to stand up on end, he can cause the sea to part. He can cause the lion's mouths to close. He can cause Pharaoh to resist him until all of the deities of Egypt are laid low. He can cause the god Dagon of the Philistines to be knocked over in worship before the presence of the Ark of the Covenant. And when they stand it back up to knock him over again and knock off his head, his hands, and his feet at the same time. He can cause a little boy with a rock and a sling to find the one vulnerable place in the armor of a nine foot tall giant. Is there anything we should fear if we're on his side? Whew. I was talking to, I don't have time for that. But if I did, I would tell you this. I was talking to a friend of mine who said, uh, <laughs> He said, man, it's been, he's been in a tough vocational position. His faith position, his belief in what God's called him to do has put him on the opposite side of the table from the powers to be in his company. 
And he's just dug his heels in like a little pit bull on a steak bone. He's just not turning loose. And uh, we were talking about that again today. You probably know what I'm talking about. We were talking about that again today. And he said, well, he's like, I have no idea if I'll be in the same place doing the same thing this time next year. Last time this happened, though, I got a promotion. <laughs> well, wait just a minute. How can that happen? No, it's the who that makes that happen. It's not the how. It's the who. And God's the who. If you fight against him, your fight's futile. But if you fight with him, then we have to remember every detail is within his purview. Every single detail. So perhaps we ought to look for and give praise for even the smallest of details of life and rest in him. Psalm 46 verse 10, and I'm closing, says, cease striving and know that I am God. Which is the part we all like to remember and stick on a t-shirt somewhere. But he goes on and says, I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in all the earth. This is not a chance. It's not an opportunity. It's not a maybe. It's not a could be with God. He said, I will be. Quit worrying about it. Just do what I told you to do. Cease striving and just know I'm God. I'm God. That's his resume. If you pulled up God's resume, here's what it would say. I am. You can trust him. What do you need to trust him with tonight? What is it that you've been fighting against that you ought to turn over to him tonight and say, God, it's yours? Or that you've been running from that you need to run to him and say, God, take it. Would you do that tonight? I'm going to invite you wherever you are right now to just bow your head and let that place, that spot where you are become an altar of communication between you and the God of the universe the one who loves you, the one that can wake up a despot king, that can stir up the little leprechaun of a leader that wanted to have his name in lights, the one that can deliver an entire race in the, in the issuing of an order. Consider him tonight. And what do, you need to, what do you need to turn over to him? Maybe tonight you need to turn over a, a prodigal. Maybe tonight you need to turn over that job decision. Maybe tonight you need to hand God that bucket full of your fears and anxieties and concerns and cares. Maybe you need to give God tonight that medical decision. Maybe you need to release to him tonight that that uncertainty that's been looming before you. Thank you for taking time to view this message. Notice that I called it a message, not a lesson or a talk, because I pray that as God intended it to communicate to our church, that he's spoken through it into your life as well. Perhaps the most important decision in our lives is what we'll do with the messages that God speaks to us. The Bible says that one of those messages from God relates to his love. John 3, verses 16 and 17 says, For God so loved the world, you could insert your name there, that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And then it goes on and says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Romans 5 and verse 8 says, God didn't leave us just with a verbal witness of that. It says, God demonstrates his love toward us. And while we were yet in rebellion and sin against God, Christ died for us. The Bible tells us what we all know somewhat intuitively, that we're here for a purpose and that we rebelled against that created purpose in the choices of our lives. The Bible calls that sin and tells us that we all have this in common. But while that rebellion, that sin is common, it's not okay with God. In fact, because he's absolutely perfect and righteous, he expects us to be as well since we're created in his image. Now. You recognize the problem. If he expects our perfect righteousness and we're in fact rebellious sinners, we cannot fulfill our created purpose. This is where the greatest miracle of all time takes place. Before you and I were ever born, God saw our condition and made provision for us to be forgiven and to get a new chance at experiencing God's purpose for our lives. He sent his own and only son 
that if we would confess him as the Lord of our lives, that is the boss, the owner, believing that Christ died on our behalf, being judged in our place for our rebellion, and that having settled this debt of judgment, rose from the dead on the third day, that we might trust in him with great confidence, we can be saved. In that experience of salvation through our obedient response to Jesus as our Lord, we actually experience a cosmic transfer. It's what theologians call imputed righteousness, meaning Christ's righteousness, his goodness, everything right about him is actually credited to us. How can we be sure? The Bible says we have to trust this by faith. In other words, we must place our hope in this, truly believe it in our hearts that God can do and has done precisely what he claims in his holy word. If you've never made this confession, truly made it from your heart, today you could, and we would love to celebrate it with you. My prayer of confession many years ago was quite simple, but it was from the heart. And if you wish, you too could pray to the Lord in this way. A prayer like, God, I know that I'm a rebel and I've sinned, and I believe that Jesus died in my place to settle the debt of judgment for my sin. I'm asking you, Jesus, to forgive my sin, and I'm confessing that you are now the Lord of my life. I choose to follow you for the rest of my life, trusting you with my life forever. Amen. And if you prayed a prayer like that with me, the Bible says that all eternity has changed for you. It'd be my privilege to help you experience the new reality of living as a Jesus follower. If you'll contact us, we'd love to provide you some resources and pray for God's blessing in your new life. Here's the best way to reach us. You could email us at next at inglewoodbaptist.com or by texting the word next to the number 252-888-2227. God bless you and I hope we'll see you again soon.